Uh, hi, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Do you hear me well? Cool. Short question. Do you often use a translator? Yes. Someone know? I would say I am. I moved to Germany four years ago, and from the day one, I started to learn a German language. But it's hard, really hard. Therefore, I still prefer to validate my messages that I write in German language before sending them, just to be on the safe side, you know. And I use translator for it. There are plenty of options if you need to translate one human language to another one, for example, English to German. But what about programming languages? Is it possible to translate JavaScript to Java or C Sharp? I will give you a spoiler. <laughs> yes, it's possible. In my company, we wanted to solve exactly the same problem. My name is Alena, and I'm a full stack engineer at MongoDB. My team is working on a Compass project. It is a graphical interface for our database. Compass allows users to explore their databases and documents, write queries, create new entries and indexes, validate schemas, and much more. Compass requires input to be made in a JavaScript-based query language called MongoDB Shell. It is pretty much plain JavaScript with some sugar on top of it. But we were thinking, what if we let users to write queries using the language of their choice? For example, let Python developers write queries in a Python language, instead of forcing them learning JavaScript to interact with our application. Another use case is aggregation pipeline. It is a powerful feature of Compass that allows users to manipulate with their data. Documents enter a multi-stage data pipeline that transforms them into aggregated results. Every stage can be modified separately according to users' particular needs, and the resulting pipeline can be exported to be used in different applications. Our educational team, for example, often uses created queries and, and aggregations for the documentation. And since MongoDB has drivers for many programming languages, the documentation should be provided for all of them. In this case, it will be nice to write code snippets only once and then export them to many programming languages. To achieve both and give users maximum flexibility, our system tier 4 needed to accept multiple input languages and generate multiple output languages in an efficient way. To do so, we needed to write a language compiler, also known as transpiler or source-to-source -source compiler. So many names for one single thing. It takes the input uh, as input a source code of a program written in one programming language and produces the equivalent source code written in another programming language as its output. It's very similar to translating human languages, but instead of translating English to German, we translate JavaScript for, to Java, for example. Compass input uh, always takes the form either of a document for the query bar or an array for aggregation pipeline. It reduced the scope of the problem for us because we don't, didn't have to recognize the whole syntax of the input language, only particular parts of it. However, the subset we needed to support is large and complex enough that we decided to treat the problem as we were adding a full language support. Compass by itself is an electron desktop application written in JavaScript. It works with Webpack, React, and Redux, and I think it's a pretty much standard stack today. So to fit well into our application and to be browser friendly, our transpiler therefore also needed to be executable in JavaScript. There are some existing transpilers written in JavaScript that we consider it. However, for our use case, we needed any language to any language transformation with business document support which meant we needed a custom solution. The naive approach to support multiple input and output languages within a single application, it will be 
to match syntax of each input language to the syntax of each output language. But you can see that amount of combination just grows enormously with adding just one new language. To reduce the problem, we needed to abstract it into separated input and output stages. In this case, the input language stage just needs to build a tree, and the output language stage just needs to read data from the tree. But most compilers are broken down into three primary stages, lexical analysis, syntax analysis, and code generation. First, the stages are responsible for the building the tree, and the last stage is responsible for reading data from the tree. Lexical analysis takes the raw code and splits it into tokens. Tokens are an array of tiny little objects that describe each isolated piece of the syntax. They could be numbers, labels, punctuation, operators, whatever. Syntax analysis takes these tokens and transforms them into a tree structure that describes not only the species of the syntax, but also their relations to each other. For example, as it is shown on the slide, two identifiers, x and number one, separated by colon, represent a property assignment statement. This is the connection I'm talking about. You can think of the tree as a map, the way to read our source code in a parser language. The last stage of the compiler design is a code generation. To be honest, this is the most interesting part of writing the compiler. Therefore, we didn't want to write our own parser from scratch, since it is incredibly time-consuming even for a single language. We wanted to focus mostly on the code generation process. Luckily, there are some existing parser generator tools that use efficient techniques to parse the input language and produce a tree. They take an input grammar that is hierarchical and highly structured parse the input string based on this grammar, and convert it to a tree structure. Here is some example of the grammar file. Basically, it is a set of rules for our transpiler how to understand the input language and how all pieces of this language are connected to each other. Going from the bottom to the top, you can see that our identifier is the value of property name which is a part of property assignment statement, and so on. The tricky part is writing this grammar from scratch, because it also can be time-consuming and error-prone. To write grammar from scratch, uh, you need to know the input language very well with all its edge cases. And if Transpiler needs to support many programming languages, the task becomes much harder and more complicated. This is why we have decided to use Antler, because Antler has grammars for almost all programming languages. Grammars downloaded from the repository can also be incomplete or buggy, but at the same time, they may be free of mistakes you could potentially make if you were writing grammars from scratch. My point is, you shouldn't put in a blind trust in the code written by other developers but you can save the time and write only new rules instead of repeating existing ones. Antler is a parser generator written in Java. What is important, it has a JavaScript runtime. Therefore, we can use in our Node.js project. As expected, Antler parses the input string based on grammar and converts it to a tree structure. There are two terms that are related and sometimes used interchangeably, parse tree and abstract syntax tree. Conceptually, they're very similar because they are both trees and represent a syntax of the source code. The difference is the level of abstraction. Parse tree is more detailed tree. It contains information about all tokens and visit methods. Abstract syntax tree instead is a polished version of the parse tree where the information which is not important to understand the piece of code is just removed. When you look on the parse tree, you can definitely say from which input language it was built. But AST is a universal tree. Every programming language can be represented by the same tree. 
Antler provides two techniques for traversing the tree, visitor and listener. The operating principle and the result of both methods is very similar. However, there are some important differences here. With visitor, you have a cleaner code and a better control over transformation process. You can specify which node method should be called next and what value should be returned. Listener calls all its methods automatically and you cannot rewrite values of nodes. It means you need to store information about visited nodes somewhere outside the tree. It can affect your flexibility and performance. Like most compilers, our transpiler uses a visitor pattern and tree is actually a parse tree. Antler not only builds a parse tree, it also programmatically generates list of auxiliary files for us. Lexer is responsible for lexical analysis, parser is responsible for syntax analysis and building the tree, and visitor class provides methods for traversing the tree. But we shouldn't use the visitor class created by Antler directly. If we change the content of a grammar file, it will also change the content of auxiliary files, what we put there, and we will lose all our custom code with the next iteration. We should subclass the Antler generated visitor class, override the empty visit methods, and define what each method should do with each type of a tree node. Since Antler builds a parse tree, we have a first problem to solve here. As you remember, parse tree is this type of the tree that keeps information about all input language tokens. It means that the Java parse tree and, for example, Java, JavaScript and Java parse trees will look differently and should be traversed differently because they have completely different syntax despite of maze. However, recruiters often send me Java developer opportunities, like JavaScript, Java sounds similar. I don't know how to solve this problem, but traversing different parse trees can be achieved by having one visitor class for each input language. Um, this code snippets illustrate the basic structure of the pro program that uh, builds a parse tree from the JavaScript input string. We require auxiliary files and let Antler to pull characters from the input string, convert it to a character stream, then to the token stream, and finally build a parse tree. Note that the parsing stage and the resulting parse tree are determined only by the input language. Currently, there is no information about output language at all. One other thing I want to draw attention to is an entry point of the tree traversal. According to the grammar, the top rule of the Yekma script tree is a program rule. However, it doesn't mean that we always should start traversing from this rule. In our case, we started from expression sequence rule to reduce the size of the tree. You can choose any entry point according to your particular needs. So the visitor calls its method starting from the root node and recursively descending to leaves in a depth first order. Then it proceeds in the reverse order and substitutes a higher level node with the new formatted value. In the most straightforward case, in our uh, custom visitor class, we only specify the entry point of the tree traversal. The visit expression sequence method is not defined here, therefore the method with the same name will be called from the parent under generated ECMAScript visitor class, which defaults to return the original value of the node. One by one, we add methods to our custom visitor class to implement our transformation logic. For example, we overwrite with a terminal method to return text value of the terminal node instead of its internal tree representation. But not always we can just return the text value of the terminal node. It is much harder than it looks if you want to have accurate results. 
you should transform floating point numbers as well as numbers in different numeral systems without losing any precision. For string literals, you should think about single and double quotes, comments, escape sequences, spaces, empty lines. Do you want to support them or not? You can make an effort and keep users' input format, or you can transform it to a some language standard. On the one hand, formatted code may look more professional. On the other hand, users of your compiler may be not satisfied if they expect the original format of the code. There is no universal solution for this problem, as it requires a more detailed investigation of the scope of using the compiler. Here is another example. In Python, object property name must be enclosed in the single quotes, while in a JavaScript it is optional. In this particular case, this is only one modification we need to transform a fragment of a JavaScript code into Python code. So what happens inside of a JavaScript object, like any object? We just assign something to the object property name, right? According to the grammar, this assignment happens in visit property expression assignment method. To get key and value of the object, we need to traverse child nodes separately, like left-hand side and right-hand side subtrees. Traversing these subtrees returns us original or formatted values of nodes, according to the logic we implemented there. And then we can use these values to build a new string, in our case, Python output string. And we don't forget to enclose key in single quotes to get the proper Python output. There is another example how we can impact on the parse process. We can update our grammar and teach our compiler to recognize new keywords. The highlighted number keyword was added to the initial grammar. To match the pattern, the source code should have the number keyword followed by arguments. We also specified number expression label that will be used as a name of new visit method. As you can see, we have a total control of our transpiler. In just a few lines of code, we transform a number keyword into int keyword, and now it is a proper Python output. The same way we can add any keywords to the grammar, even if they don't exist in the original version of the language. It means we can create our own language and then transform it to another language, and so on is first. So much fun, right? But we still have some place for improvements here. Do you know where? No? Right here. We're still using a brute force solution to generate an output string right inside our visit method. In this case, to have several output languages, we will need to create several visit number expression methods for every output language. Overall, this approach would subclass every language-specific visitor class to each output language. Or worse yet, to put a giant switch statement in each visit method with a case for each output language. Well, looks bad. We didn't like any of those solutions. Therefore, we decided to introduce a set of classes called generators. Using of a generator is determined by the output language, and using of the visitor is determined by the input language. Since one at a time, we need to transform only one input language to only one output language. We will have to, we will have an instance of the transpiler, which knows how to deal just with two languages and doesn't care about other languages' combinations. Here is a simplified example how it can be achieved. We basically combine together two classes, visitor and generator, and build a transpiler instance that knows how to translate JavaScript to Python, for example. This architecture allows us to add input languages and output languages independently. For example, we can go, we can add Go language generator and start to translate JavaScript to Go 
And we don't need to write new visitor because the input language stays the same and we already have visitor for the JavaScript. Our design was informed by the need for the visitor to be able to call generator methods without needing to know which generator they were using. Since code generation has a lot in common regardless of the output language, we wanted to implement the system that could abstract the default behavior as much as possible and only leave generators to handle edge cases. We decided to not require generators inside of the visitors because in this case we needed to require all possible generators and make sure that they, they all have methods with the same name. It will be hard to maintain. But instead, we inherited the generator class from the visitor class. As a result, the generator got access to all visitor and generator methods. We also decided to introduce three name methods, visit, process, and emit, to make it easier to understand where we are in the parse process. Visit methods are defined in under generated visitor class and being overwritten in our custom visitor class. Process methods belongs to our custom visitor class and emit methods are defined in the generators. Visit methods are being called during the tree traversal and now instead of returning string directly, we check if the corresponding emit method exists. If this method doesn't exist, then the visitor will return the original value of the node. In our case, it will be JavaScript string. But if the visitor has found proper emit method, it delegates the transformation process to the generator. Due to the dynamic nature of JavaScript, it actually doesn't matter that we have visitor and generator as separate classes. When we built a transpiler instance, it combines these two classes together and visitor can call generator methods and generator can call visit methods to continue the tree traversal. By doing this, we free our visitor from knowing anything about output language. We just assume that it can be some generator class that knows how to handle the output language. In more complex cases, we need to do some pre-processing in the visitor before we can call any emit method. For example, dates are complex case because dates have a wide range of acceptable format of arguments according to different programming languages. So we need to do some pre-processing on the visitor to ensure that all generators will receive the same information. The easiest way is execute JavaScript and construct a JavaScript date object and pass it to the generator. Since JavaScript date object is already tokenized, we can safely extract such information as year, month, date, and build a new output string. We, here we built a Python output date. With this design for every input language we add, we only need to define a sim single visitor. Similarly, for every output language we add, we only need to define a single generator, instead of defining one visitor generator for each language combination. This is how our transpiler looks inside of the Compass application. The lastest version supports um, MongoDB shell and JavaScript as input languages and generate such output languages as Java, C Sharp, Python, MongoDB shell, and JavaScript. The work on Python as an input language is currently underway. The Compass Transpiler includes all techniques I was talking about today, but at the same time, it is much complex and powerful system that accepts the larger syntax format. It is entire Bilson library function calls with arguments and types validation, informative error messages. And the code is actually open source, so therefore you can open our repository, download it, and run this transpiler on your local machine, and you can see all the code there. To summarize, when writing our transpiler, we were guided by the 
it follow principles of writing a compiler, such as lexical analysis, syntax analysis, and tree traversal. We used Antler to reduce the size of the manual work required for the parsing of the input language of the interest, what allowed us to focus mostly on the code generation process. A major benefit of splitting visitors and generators is that we can add them separately. And when we add visitor, we don't care about which generators are already implemented. The same rules apply for adding a generator. We don't need to know which visitors are already implemented. We also have added a high level of optimization by using string templates, what allowed us to even more abstract the code generation process. For example, for Python, we managed to move everything from the generator to string templates. As I mentioned before, we wanted to keep generators to only handle edge cases. And since Python doesn't have edge cases, its generator is completely empty. It makes adding new output languages very straightforward. Therefore, we encourage the community to participate and write new languages support. You can find more information about it on our contribution section on the GitHub. We will be very excited to see your pull requests. Thank you for having me today and for the listening. It was pretty technical, but I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Do you have some questions? Thank you very much for a great overview about what you did with the transpiling. I have one, oh, sorry, uh, one question though. Like, what ruled out other transpilers? For instance, I could think of LLVM and their ER language, which can basically translate anything to anything. Why haven't you chosen something like that instead? Uh, the first thing we needed it to be executable in JavaScript. There are lots of awesome transpilers that, for example, can be used for Java in, in other languages that usually deal with translating languages. And also, we have our BSAN uh, object. This is, uh, you know, like, like extended JSON. And we needed to support all custom methods. So when we investigated this problem, we realized that for us, it will be easier to maintain, to support, and deliver for like web browser applications. And we decided to have our own implementation. Did I answer your question? Uh, I, I will not name the methods I can maybe name them wrong because for me it was the first experience to implement in something like this. I was pretty excited to learn this new stuff, especially about Antler. So before it was the slide that listed all these transpilers in the slide, but I decided to remove it. But you can come to me later. I found the old slide and I will show what we investigated and why we decided to not use it. Cool. Anyone else? No one. You can also ask her JavaScript questions, I guess. What's the, your most pressing JavaScript question? I just learned that, that, that you cannot write um, a project called Twitter and put the dependency Twitter in it. What? Yeah, <laughs> didn't know that before. You no. cannot, yeah, okay, this was my question. Can uh, show you do me. it? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, anyone else? No, then give it away for Alina. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.